This is the 20th in a series of lectures on differential geometry. In this lecture, we want to understand how, finally, to make sure that uh, manifolds, uh, maps between manifolds can avoid some kind of degeneracy and behave in some kind of uh, non-degenerate manner, avoiding satisfying a partial differential equation insofar as we can make it happen. Um, so last time we talked about uh, how to describe uh, di jets of maps between manifolds in some sense Taylor series expansions. Um, that makes sense out of the notion of differential equations, as we'll see. And then we want to try to not satisfy those differential equations. We also showed that last time that smooth, uh, smooth maps uh, form a bare space, so that the set of maps that doesn't satisfy various conditions, uh, if we can make those conditions be open and we have countable collection of them, we can take the intersection and still get lots of maps not satisfying any of them. First, let's think a little bit about submersions. Um, we know a lot about submersions by the implicit function theorem. So a submersion meant a map from some manifold P to some manifold Q. And I always think of this kind of picture. This is how I picture it in my head. What is a submersion? There's a P, there's a Q, or something like that. It's two manifolds. And there's a map, which is often called something like pi. And um, and intuitively, the picture says that, um, that I, I could take a a point of Q, and then I could look at the points of P that map to it, the fiber, and all the fibers look sort of um, uh, nicely mapped. Um, they're all nice, smooth submanifolds. Um, so uh, the definition, of course, of submersion was that the derivative map uh, taking tangent space at P to uh, tangent space at Q, where this Q naught is pi of p naught is the corresponding point. So we have a point p naught up here and a point q naught down here. We map from one to the other. We map the tangent space here to the tangent space here. So tangent vectors up here, which could point up or down a little bit, um, get mapped to flat ones here, sitting on this flat plane. So the tangent uh, vectors to the tangent vectors, this should be on to. That's the definition of submersion, is that this map is onto. But we know by the implicit function theorem, it means that uh, it's possible always to find coordinates. Um, so there exist uh, some coordinates, let's say uh, x1 to xq on q, and then uh, x1 to xq, y1 to yp on p so that in those coordinates the projection map is expressed and again I'll write it as pi of x y so this is x this is y equals uh, just x so um, and again I'm making the as always making this a uh, um, slightly tricky and maneuver where um, there's an abstract map between abstract manifolds, and it's called pi. We write out the charts, and we say, well, each point of P corresponds to some point in this chart, each point of Q to some point in this chart, and then, uh, so pi takes P to Q, so it should take a point corresponding to some x, y values to some point corresponding to some of these values, and that's how it's expressed. So this is pi as written in the charts. Um, and again, that's not, strictly speaking, the same pi that's pi as written in these charts, matched up with this pi by the by the the uh, charts themselves. As I said before, we can't resist this nice notation in which to write the thing. But it says, in other words, that this thing just looks like a linear projection mapping it locally, locally on little open sets in P. We want to think of it, picture it, uh, much like this sort of picture, that each point of um, of the underlying manifold Q has above it a fiber of P. And so you can think of it almost as if Q is carrying above each of its points a fiber. And so Q is kind of parameterizing a family of submanifolds. You can imagine that each point, uh, little q in Q, has associated, um, or let's say Q naught in Q, has an associated fiber above it, which we'll often write as something like PQ naught, and which is rigorously defined as uh, the points of P that map to Q naught. 
but uh, you can see it in the picture as a kind of a kind of picture of of, of submanifolds corresponding to points. So that you have various points here and various submanifolds here, and so you can think of Q as kind of a family of submanifolds. Q parameterizes a family of submanifolds in P, or you can think of P consisting of those submanifolds, those those various manifolds um, over the points of Q. So each point of Q has this associated submanifold up here that it, that it knows about, and that leads us naturally to uh, to the definition of a of a section of a submersion um, a section of some submersion um, is a choice of a map that associates so here's Q at rest it's almost always best to just draw the picture and to say what I'm talking about so I think of P as being some sort of box and Q some kind of flat thing and I map each point to it to its shadow underlying it's not a very well done picture but that's supposed to be the map pi um, because it's a linear um, a linear uh, uh, surjective linear map in appropriate coordinates a section um, S of this guy is a map which associates, which takes to each point Q. I'm going to take a point downstairs, uh, some point, let's say Q down here, and I'm going to pick a point that goes to it, some P equals S of Q upstairs. So for each point Q downstairs, I want to pick a point that maps to it. Um, so it's a map uh, S takes Q to P so that each S of each point, little Q, down here lies in the fiber over that point. So S of Q is in the fiber, PQ, for all Q. Um, so, or in other words, to, another way to write that is that pi of S of Q, if you go up by S and then back down by pi, you come back down to where you were for all Q in Q. Okay, so a section is a sort of a natural notion associated with submergence. A simple example um, of of this notion of section and why it's important, um, if we think about the tangent bundle, um, you take a man M any manifold and you look at um, the obvious map that takes the tangent bundle of M to M pi, where pi of point and vector at that point is just the point. Remember that we wrote our elements of the tangent bundle as pairs of, of a point and a vector. Um, but in, we always think of it as, a, as, as, as if it was just a vector at a point. So at this point M, we have this vector V, and that pair of objects is, is a single element, a single point in TM. Um, then uh, a section, what is a section? Um, it should be a map S, which goes the other way, takes M to TM, so that uh, S at any point M is in the fiber, which in this case is the tangent plane, the tangent space of the manifold at, at M0. So S is exactly a vector field. A smooth section is just a smooth vector field because it associates to each point of our manifold M at every point M, it associates a vector V that sits at that point. So it's exactly uh, the data of a vector field. So that's one example of uh, computing sections, and it gives you some idea why they're important. Uh, vector fields are a choice of a vector at every point of, of M. And similarly, uh, if we have an arbitrary submersion of P to Q, a section picks uh, something in the fiber at each point. So it's a, it's a way of, of constructing some local information at each point um, and, and having that information smoothly vary from point to point. Um, okay, so that's a, a reason why we'd care about sections. A, a local section, uh, sections don't always exist. There's exa there are examples in the, in the notes. Um, a local section just means that it's defined only on some open. A subset of Q, so it's not defined everywhere. And every submersion emits lots of local sections by the implicit function theorem. It doesn't have to admit global sections, but it certainly has to admit local ones because the implicit function theorem says it really just looks like some kind of map locally. It looks like pi of x, y equals x. And so a section uh, has to be, well, it has to, a local section, let's say, has to be a map S, which to each point downstairs, so the points down here are x and up here are choices of some x and y, and the map is a linear projection map that may be many x variables, maybe many y variables, which is the projection map that forgets the y variables. 
Um, there has to be a local section because it just could be anything. Well, it has to go back up to the same point X upstairs to be a section. It has to be in the fiber uh, over this point X. And so the fiber consists of all the well, the X's and Y's, but it could be any Y of X. So a section looks like that. Um, okay, so that's the what local sections look like in those kind of of charts where the where where the map becomes a linear projection, and therefore there are lots of local sections. You can take any uh, Y of X uh, smooth. So it's natural to think about um, jets of sections, since we have local sections. We can take jets of local sections. We let P, um, what was my notation here? PR, I think. Um, uh, no, if I got, okay, PR is the traditional notation, um, is the R jets. Not of all maps, but the R jets of local sections. So keeping track of R derivatives, so that should be R jets. All uh, possible choices of local sections, and you take their jets at all possible points where they're defined. So if we have such a section uh, in those kind of, of, of coordinates where there are X's down on the downstairs manifold Q, and upstairs there's some X's and Y's, and uh, and the map is just pi of X, Y is just X, the X part, um, then uh, we know that sections look like uh, sections are just s of x is x, y of x. And so the jets of the sections can be expressed as Taylor series, Taylor expansions. Um, how do we write these Taylor expansions? Well, again, it's convenient to write them because this is just going to be x, and it's convenient to write them as y um, uh, equals f of x minus x for some plus higher order terms, and this is some order r, uh, at the most r polynomial, and these are the terms of higher order than r. Um, and, and so we expand them out in some abstract variable, capital X, and little x should represent the point around which we're expanding. So again, uh, the choice of, we have um, some coordinates on, um, on the r jets, uh, given by each R jet is uniquely determined by knowing what which point X it's expanded about. In other words, which point of the underlying uh, manifold Q we're working on. Um, and then when we try to pick a jet up here of some some local section defined on some little open set here, some little local section, we can calculate its jet by calculating out this polynomial. And of course, when I write this, I really mean write down its coefficients. So write down the point x and the various coefficients of the polynomial f as some giant vector with lots and lots of, of entries. If we actually make r very large, it's going to have enormously many entries. That's why it's better to just think of it as an abstract polynomial, not try to write down some horrible expression for it, because it just becomes so complicated to write out all, der all the various derivatives involved. If we were, for example, to try to use these coordinates to do something, we could look at uh, P0 is the zero jets. And what are zero jets? Well, those are just values because uh, the zero jet of a map is just the value it takes on to zeroth order derivatives. But that just means that it's exactly P itself because we know the zero jet of a section. If we have to make a section that goes through a particular point, um, so here's Q and here's P as usual, you take a point X. And then you just have to know what's the value of x and y that, it, that our section goes through. The zero jet of section is just what its value is at that particular point. And so it's just a pair x, y, so it's just a point of p. But in our coordinates, um, in, our, in our coordinates, uh, we wrote each point of, the, of pr, the r jets, we wrote the points as a pair x and a polynomial in abstract variables, capital X, of order r. And then now that means that P0, which is just P, has coordinates given by X's and Y's. And of course we map this to this by, by the map Y is F at uh, 0. Because we expanded it around uh, little x. So it's this expansion around little x. So when you plug in 0, you're actually working at the point little x. And you can see immediately this is just a, a linear map, really. Um, so this is also a, 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 the PR to P0 mapping uh, that we've written down here is, in fact, again, uh, a, a submersion. 
Now we want to think about how we're going to try to wiggle out of satisfying a differential equation or avoid as much as we can satisfying a differential equation. What's a differential equation? A, a differential, we won't call it equation, but in this subject it's usually called a differential relation. Uh, it's just a subset, uh, let's say, uh, A contained in uh, PR. And so it consists of the jets, the R jets, uh, that satisfy this, uh, that satisfy some relation. So it's just a subset of, of R jets. And we can say that a solution to the differential equation is, is some section whose R jets all satisfy this. They all live inside, inside this A, this set A. So we can now state the Tom transversality, uh, transversality theorem. Uh, which is that, um, so if we're given a differential relation, A contained in some PR, uh, then on a smooth submersion, uh, the generic uh, smooth section, so a generic way of associating, you know, at each point of Q, some up, some point of P up above it, the generic smooth section um, has uh, has R jet. Okay, not maybe not uh, maybe we can't avoid the differential relation, but we try and avoid it as much as possible. It's not maybe not avoiding it, but it's at least transverse to A. In particular. Um, in particular, um, if there exists a C0 continuous section, then um, there exists a C infinity transverse transverse section. So we can bump up C0 to C infinity transverse. Now the bumping up is the is a bit I'm not going to really prove. Um, I've said before that continuous maps can be approximated by smooth ones and that's what we'd use here as the first step. So um, so the first step in the proof is uh, smooth uh, the C0 to C infinity and I'm not going to prove that. That's done in parts of the notes, the lecture notes that we won't cover. Um, the essential technique is to use convolution in local charts to try to smooth continuous things out. And, and it's not horribly difficult, but um, we just don't have time to cover everything. Okay, so um, so uh, the definition we have of transversality is being that transversal to, transversal to A is exactly... Uh, we said that something was transversal to a set, a transver, sorry, transversal uh, to every uh, submanifold, um, some S1, S2 to the dot, in a sequence um, covering A. So you just cover A in a sequence. So you have this A, which uh, you know maybe is some some sort of picture that we've given of some kind of you know, Whitney uh, umbrella or something like that, and uh, and then uh, you cover it in a submanifold here, in a submanifold here, and so on. And so we said that that was the definition for for a sub transversality, and. Um, uh, because uh, of our of our bear uh, uh, bear theorem, the the bear property of the smooth functions uh, said that uh, we could we only had need to prove things uh, you know for countable uh, dense open sets. We take these countable collection of dense open sets and then we're fine. We can take the intersection. So if we prove the result for each of these S's, um, we'll actually be writing it in the process as uh, a, there'll be a countable intersection of dense open sets for this one, a countable uh, intersection of dense open sets for this one, and so on and so forth. The countably many uh, countable intersections, we can intersect them all, and we get a countable intersection. So, uh, so for S1, we get some countable intersection, U1, intersect U1, 2, da, 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 da. For S2, we get some countable intersection, U2, 1, U2, 2, intersect, da, 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 da. And that would just intersect all of those, intersect them all. 
a uh, for a for transversal to s to each of the s's you you have to check that these are that these are going to be dense and then for a it's just going to be the intersection of all of these guys is dense so it's good enough to just check each one of these um, and then we can uh, check that each one of them has this this generic property and then we can intersect all the open, dense open sets involved in all of them to produce the property for a so uh, so without loss of generality uh, a is just a submanifold, which I'll, I think, call S to, to suit my notes. And it's embedded, I should say. These are these are embedded um, submanifolds. So this is an embedded submanifold. So we'll have to check it for an embedded submanifold. So now for each um, uh, for each compact set K contained in the underlying Q, let's let uh, U K be um, the set of smooth set of all smooth sections yes um, uh, so that uh, transverse uh, transverse to a over all the points of K so we'll pick a compact set and we'll won't achieve global transversality we just achieved on the on that sorry uh, let k so this is a compact set k is a compact set and in q and we let u k be all the sections which are transverse to a over over that compact set k not maybe globally over all of q but uh, just over that that um, set k so um so what we want to do is to is to first get these things to be non-empty and then try to uh, to construct uh, one f uh, to try and make make the thing work globally. So this is going to be trying to, to localize the problem. Now um, uh, transversality uh, of um, of the let's say the what did I say R jets of S to some set A uh, is a condition. On R plus one jets, because transversality requires that the derivatives uh, be pushing across. So oh, there's not a. Am I calling it a? Am I? I guess I'm calling it a. Okay. So my sub. This is my embedded submanifold. So the transversality of 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 this section to this embedded submanifold, this map to this embedded submanifold, is a condition on its first derivatives of the map. Or the first derivatives of this map are given by the by the R plus first derivatives of S. And in fact, it's an open condition. Because uh, because it really only requires some non-degeneracy of some derivatives that they have to sort of satisfy some kind of non uh, non-zero angle kind of condition, um, and so it's an open condition, and so it represents an open set. So U K is um, uh, re well comes from an open set in the R plus one derivatives. So that means that UK is open the strong topology. Now suppose instead of just one compact set, we we don't study it there. We've got to, we have to study a lot of them. Suppose that KI are compact subsets of Q, uh, that we have a sequence of them and um, uh, locally finite. cover of Q by sequence of compact sets, then uh, the intersection of the sections that are transverse over the Ki is just the union of the sections transverse over the, uh, sorry, is the, the un uh, is, <laughs> is the sections that are transverse over the union of the Ki's. Um, so to be transverse over each of the Ki's is to be transverse over each of the Ki's. And that's just going to be UQ. That's going to be transverse over all of U, all of Q. So we just need to make sure that this, um, uh, that we can get um, some kind of density. Why? So if uh, you know, this is a countable intersection, so if um, UK I is dense, then it's certainly open and strong topology. So uh, so this is an accountable intersection of dense open sets. So then UQ is dense, and we're done. That's the result. So we need to prove that, uh, we just need to prove 
um, prove that every UK is in fact dense in the strong topology. So in other words, we need to prove that um, that's exactly saying that every um, that every um, uh, section, um, sorry, every strong neighborhood uh, contains um, sections um, that every strong neighborhood um, contains sections uh, which are in in UK so uh, A transverse over uh, the compact set K. We can choose their Ks to be as small as we like. Um, we can still cover by countably many of them, make them very, very tiny. And so we can assume that K, um, without loss of generality, is contained in some uh, chart domain. In other words, where some coordinates are defined uh, on Q, some uh, coordinates. And um, then we can also make sure that um, um, we have associated coordinates on y1 to y something on p. Um, um, we can assume those coordinates cover the region where some particular uh, smooth map is defined that we want to study and we want to get close to it. So. Um, so we just have to uh, work in these coordinates. The tricky bit is we have to try and figure out how to localize this so that we only have to do the estimate inside the coordinate chart. And that's a bit tricky. To make that work, first of all, I'm going to assume that the charts uh, have uh, convex images um, in Euclidean space. So they're charts from abstract manifolds to, uh, to Euclidean space. And I don't want them to just be any lumpy old sets. I want the images chart to actually be something convex. And that way I'll be able to, to take convex um, combinations of things. And if that doesn't happen, we can always use smaller charts. We can take any chart and then take a convex region here and then restrict the chart to the inverse image of that so it does work. So we can always arrange this. Okay, so what we have to do at this point is uh, we just have to pick a section which is given by some map y equals y of x in our chart. Um, and we need to make sure that um, make sure that A transverse sections, the ones whose R jets are A transverse, um, uh, enter every every strong neighborhood of that section. But they have to be, um, well, A transverse, let's say, over K, over our compact set. Just to, to make convenient notation, we can always change, uh, change variables, change coordinates, to get that Y equals 0 is our section, just by subtracting Y of X from the Y variables. So that means what we need to do is we need to make sections um, sections which are A transverse and have the weird property that they uh, they go to zero with oh, with as many derivatives as we need um, so that they're they're going to go to zero um, eventually with more and more derivatives as we go on through the through the through the sequence. Um, The next step really is to localize. The problem is that we've got to construct global sections divided by the whole manifold, but we want to work in this little coordinate region. We've got coordinate charts, again, the x's and some um, and some y's, which we like. Uh, we're perfectly happy with those. The problem is that we don't get to work just in those because we have to work globally. We have to use global sections. So how can we avoid that? Suppose that we can find uh, can find uh, local sections um, with uh, a transversality over um, over our compact set K, so we can make it work, but only locally um, uh, defined, but defined only in the chart domain.
So that's the bad news. They're only defined in some chart domain. They're not globally defined. That They won't work for us. Um, but they're approaching zero. Um, so we have these sections. So some sort of y equals something of uh, something of x, y equals something else of x, and so on and so forth. And they're all going to zero. They're squeezing to zero with at least you know, with r derivatives, let's say, so that they, they are in our r jet world. They're actually squeezing down to the y equals zero section. Um, so, uh, so then we can just use a bump function. to glue them uh, to uh, some um, uh, to something outside, well, to, uh, to 0, to y equals 0 outside of our complex set, so that they're going to, uh, they're going to glue down onto the y equals 0. They do whatever they have to do to be a transverse, and they go back down to 0. Um, so that's the picture that we want to think of. And we kill them off, and that only works because we made sure that we had these convex chart domains. We, we said, I, I said, I wanted the image of my charts not to just be any old thing, but to be some kind of convex set because I want to make sure that in the charts, I can do this bump functioning because I have some charts valued in some y's, and I need to make sure that they aren't just any old wriggly thing; that they're actually convex uh, because then I can multiply by a bump function and stay. Uh, inside a region that contains zero. So I'll be safe um, to, to multiply by that bump function and glue sections together. So that'll make sure that when we glue the sections together, it agrees with this with section, which is given by y equals zero, which we knew actually somehow extends, we don't know how, but it doesn't matter, somehow extends to a global section. We changed coordinates to make it be y equals zero, and then we took anything else uh, that we wanted to construct and use a little bump function to glue it on to y equals zero. So we get a nice, uh, nice section that is global now, globally defined, and it's going to be a transverse where we need it to be. So that localizes the problem. Now we only have to work inside this little chart, and the little chart is where we have our coordinates. So now, without loss of generality, we can say that P is an open set in Euclidean space. Some R, uh, P plus Q, and Q is an open set in Euclidean space R, Q, and so on. So everything's very straightforward, and we don't have to work with manifolds anymore. We can just work in the little charts and in the chart domains. So now in our charts, we can write points of P, R, uh, are, are uh, now expressed as a little x point around to the Taylor expand, and then some Taylor series that pops out there um, for, some, for some chart, or for some, for some map of, of from P to Q. Or sorry, from Q to P, from some section. So this is our our, our expression, our local expression of a section. So our, our we said our section would look like um, some function, which is somehow f of well, let's say y of x, uh, in abstract variables x is f of x minus x, some polynomial uh, plus higher order terms, um, and that'll be what all of our sections look like. That and those are coordinates on this manifold. Let's suppose we expand the same function around 0 instead of, uh, I want y of x is also this same function. It's something else around 0. What's the difference between, how do I go from Taylor series around point x to Taylor series around point uh, capital X uh, plus, well, we don't, by the way, since we're only dealing with jets, we're only dealing with jets, we can forget about all the higher order terms. They don't really matter. So we can just compute with the lower order terms, and it's rather trivial to convince yourself that the right result is if this is supposed to equal this, then I uh, change capital X to uh, capital X plus little x, and I get f tilde of uh, of x is f of, let's see what I have there, uh, it gives me the same thing that I can calculate. f of x is um, f tilde of x plus little x. So there's a formulas to go back and forth between the little f's and the, uh, there are the f's, uh, tilde's, and the regular f's. So there's Taylor series around some point little x and Taylor series around uh, little x equals zero. We go back and forth between the Taylor series. So I want to now define a map, um, which is a map, uh, let's call it capital Phi, and it's going to take R jets and it's going to take them to, um, to what do I want to take them to? Uh, to points, uh, to, oh yeah, to polynomials uh, of degree uh, less than or equal to r um, by phi of, what's my formula for phi 
of point x and f of x in my chart. So this is a point and this is a polynomial and with abstract variables capital X um, is simply going to be um, f tilde of capital X, in other words, which we've convinced ourselves is capital X, x minus little x. So this is a map, and it's a well-defined map in this chart. It depends on the choice of chart, and it's very chart, very heavily chart dependent. If you change the choice of your chart, this won't work out neatly at all. But it does have the interesting property that what we've done is to figure out if we know the point little x, and they know the series that we're, we've Taylor series we've expanded around the point little x, we can calculate out the Taylor series we'd expand around the point zero, around the origin. Um, and you can immediately convince yourself that, well, by our formulas, capital F tilde of x is capital F of x minus little x, and capital F of x is F tilde of x plus little x. These convince me that this, for a fixed little x, is actually just a diffeomorphism. In fact, it's a it's a linear isomorphism. So it's um, so it, it's it's you know possible to go back and forth between those two descriptions. In particular, uh, this is a smooth map. This guy's a smooth map because the coefficients of this guy are just linear combinations. The coefficients of that guy. Um, so it's not very deep. Um, so it's a smooth map, and each fiber. Uh, uh, what are the fibers? Um, they consist of the um, polynomials. Uh, well, well, they, they're little x's and capital F of x's um, with a given uh, um, polynomial expansion. At the origin, at the, the around the origin. So they're, they're the, they, So what we're doing is we're going to take the fiber, this map. What do I mean by the fiber? I'm taking take some f tilde of x, and then solve the equation phi of little x, f of x is f tilde of x. Um, take the solutions um, of that equation, and um, and so so that's a smooth map. These are the fibers of the map, and they consist of um, the um, so each fiber is um, the um, expansions or jets uh, of R jets of this function. So they're R jets of that particular function. And so they are they're in particular, they are the R jets of an actual section of a section. Our sections look like s of x is some x and f tilde of x. So we've actually got a section. So what we're saying is this map takes the abstract manifold PR to polynomials. But if you pick a polynomial and you look at which guys in P of R go to it, they're exactly the jets of that of that particular polynomial. Um, okay. So that means uh, by our previous result. Um, we said the um, uh, uh, the fibers are of of phi are the generic fiber uh, is transverse or uh, a transverse. How do we know that? That's by uh, theorem uh, we had two lectures ago. Um, that at the fibers of a of a submersion, we can see it's a nice submersion. Fibers of a submersion are, are always transverse, um, and so away from a measure zero set, away from a measure zero set, um, and so in fact um, that means that there is a, a, a one that isn't um, that. That, that is, oh, sorry, there is something that is tra a transverse that isn't in that measure zero set. So there's something a transverse, and so we have a an a transverse fiber. Uh, so we have an a transverse. Well, the fibers are of course uh, the jets of a section, so we have an a transverse section uh, locally, and that is all we needed. We need to do it locally over some complex set, and there we go. So um, okay. So that's uh, the proof of that result. Very, very difficult, heavy result. Certainly the most difficult thing we've proven. Um, every step is not so bad, but the big picture is it's a fairly heavy proof. Okay, so we want to um, see some applications of this transversality proof. Um, the simplest case, uh, if we just take uh, 
some manifolds, let's say M and manifolds. Um, and we take the trivial stupid example of a, of, of a submersion, which is the example of M cross N goes to say M by the map X, Y goes to X. That's a trivial example of a submersion. And so a section, what's a section of that map? That's got to be something that goes this way, some section. And it's just exactly S of X is some X, which is, as we said before, Y of X, or Y is any map from M to N, any smooth map. So we can say that uh, the sections of this P to Q, in this example where P is defined to be M cross N, Q is defined to be M, the bundle map is defined to be this guy, this is the map pi, um, sections of this guy are exactly uh, maps m to n. So we can think of maps as a special case of sections, which is important. So, um, so this is one way to give rise to sections. We probably could have covered all that before we talked about the transversality theorem. Um, but it does have the consequence, therefore, that um, as a simple example, if you take A contained in N, uh, any um, set, um, well, let's say just for simplicity, let's do an embedded submanifold. Um, and then you have a map. Let's suppose you have some map uh, psi takes m to n. Then the transversality theorem um, that we just proved tells us that there is some a transverse guy. So there exists, uh, well, the generic uh, perturbation of this map is a transverse. So there exists some uh, perturbation. We we'll won't want to be very precise about what we mean by that, some sort of psi not takes m to n. And we could even take this to be a continuous map. And we said our result was we could smooth out and make it transverse. And this is a transverse. So we can make maps transverse to things. So if you have a if you have say a you know a plane a in three dimensional space and you have any uh, continuous curve no matter how awful you can perturb it slightly so that it becomes a transverse smooth um, and uh, so it's some wiggly thing, and it somehow it's just becomes somehow a transverse by some by some perturbation of it. And we can make sure it stays inside some uh, strong neighborhood uh, when it when it perturbs. So we can make some kind of as long as this guy has some it sits inside a strong neighborhood of some uh, smooth some smooth function, then we can some smooth map. Then we can actually keep that in there. So we can control a lot. So um, the, I stated previously we'd have the sort of one of the more remarkable applications of this result this is this theorem of Whitney. It's a weak for weaker version of the of the stronger Whitney theorem on embedding manifolds. Um, let's suppose P and Q are manifolds, um, and suppose the dimension of Q is at least twice the dimension of P. Um, then uh, the generic smooth map phi takes p to q is an immersion so it's not quite embedding as a submanifold but it's putting it as an immersed submanifold um, so before we prove it let's just think about simple examples um, if uh, p is the real number line and q is the plane then this says that if you take a map uh, you take maps you can you can um, make them sort of generically immerse. So you could take a map which isn't an immersion, which somehow does something nasty and singular, and then, um, but it's smooth map, let's say, or even just a continuous map, but uh, you could take, let's say, a smooth map uh, that has some nasty bits. Then the point is that you can slightly alter it and you can somehow uh, smooth it out so that it does something nice, so that it is an immersed an immersed map. So you can uh, get rid of the the nasty bits by immersing it. Um, and so uh, and and of course the, the 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 trickier bit is 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 that you could do it for p being say the plane and q has to be at least twice as big. So being r four, that you could take maps of the plane of two variables to four variables, and then you could slightly alter them to make them immerse the plane into four dimensional space, which is not obvious. For the, the proof of the of the theorem, um, it's very straightforward. Um, what we do, so we have some, 
there's some P, and we will have some Q, and we want to think about maps. Um, what we do is we take as a bundle, um, as or sorry, not as a bundle, as a submersion, as our submersion, as we did before, we're just going to do P cross Q goes to P, um, uh, the stupid map. And now, unfortunately, I'm switching letters P and Q. Now I'm using P for the base instead of Q, uh, base of the submersion. Um, so, um, so again, that's just by the trivial map, which is X, Y maps to X. Um, so it's not an interesting map. Um, so then, um, then let A contained in all the one jets uh, maps from P to Q be the jets um, so that in, in some, uh, in our sort of coordinates where we write, this is XI on, on P, Y, A on Q, and then we'll make some coordinates, let's call them Y, A, I's for the derivatives of Y as a function of X uh, to represent those formal variables. Um, uh, then, um, so that uh, our expression is sort of y a. Um, well, so okay. So as we've as we discussed before, these are sort of formal derivative variables. Um, um, then uh, this is the set of one jets of uh, this form, so that written out like this, so that um, uh, this matrix y a i is not a full rank. And since in our charts, in our coordinate charts, this matrix is supposed to represent the matrix of derivatives of the y's with regard to the x's in, uh, for any section. So if we had a jet, we take a one jet of a, of a section, um, a section of our bundles, um, uh, it consists of uh, maps so that, or one jet of, 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 uh, of a map will consist of, of, of having a point x uh, around which we're expanding a point of value y uh, for the map to have to take on in inside um, its target, and then um, a matrix of derivatives, and that'll be this guy, uh, this Y A I matrix. And so all we have to do is check that, um, uh, find the dimension of this uh, dimension of A equals what. So we have to look at what are all the matrices. So we really just have to look at all the matrices, um, which are not of full rank not a full rank, and that's actually not a manifold um, of, of a fixed size, right? So if we have dimensions, we get, a, we get some dimensions again, there'll be P of these and Q of these. And so our, so our matrix will be some P by Q matrix, or is it Q by P, Q by P matrix. Um, and we look at those which are not a full rank, and if Q is bigger than or equal to twice P, uh, I'll leave you to convince yourself that this actually has a dimension, which is uh, which is um, that this happens if and only if the uh, dimension of a, or the let's say the um, co-dimension, uh, is greater than or equal to the dimension of p. I won't prove it. It's not hard to convince yourself by thinking about matrices and the ranks of matrices and the linear independent rows and columns, which is something we've more or less looked at before in thinking about Grassmannians, um, that this is the condition under which we get this dimension bound. And that makes uh, sure that when we make we have transversality, these don't intersect. So dimension A, uh, a co-dimension, sorry, co-dimension A is greater than or equal to dimension P, implies uh, if and only if the transversality of uh, of a to a section uh, forces a to miss the section to miss the well the one jets of the section so um, so that's the a bit of detail about matrices about linear algebra which I don't want to do uh, completely to calculate what is the co-dimension of the set of matrices that have not do not have full rank. I'll leave you to, to convince yourself that that's covered in submanifolds of appropriate dimension so that you get uh, this transversality uh, condition forcing. So the transversality of A to a section, to the one jet of a section, means exactly they don't, they don't intersect at all. And that ensures, therefore, that, um, that, there, uh, that, that uh, the generic section doesn't touch A. In other words, the generic section has full rank uh, derivative. So it's an immersion. And uh, so if we look at um, a simple example, 
we take Q to be uh, just uh, Euclidean space of dimension 2P, where P has a uh, dimension of P equal to little p. Then, uh, uh, then, um, then uh, this says by this theorem that, as a corollary of this theorem, that P actually embeds into uh, this Euclidean space. So, or not embeds, but immerses. And so, uh, as a corollary, every uh, uh, every curve immerses in the plane. And as a corollary, every surface immerses. And maybe not are not in three dimensional Euclidean space, but at least in four dimensional Euclidean space, and so on and so forth. So that's a rather spectacular result um, that we can immerse everybody, every uh, manifold, into Euclidean space. So we uh, started off this series of lectures by thinking about a notion of abstract manifold that would be sufficiently general and abstract that we could prove nice theorems about it. It'd be useful for studying things like general relativity, also for studying things like robots or. Uh, for a wide variety of problems that would arise in, in, in mathematics and in pure mathematics and applied mathematics. We realized that because we needed to think sometimes about covering spaces and about quotient spaces, that we needed to have an abstract notion of abstract manifold. But we've now discovered that in fact manifolds actually immerse in Euclidean space, so they're not that abstract after all. It would have been fine. We didn't, wouldn't have lost any generality if we'd allowed ourselves only to work with immersive manifolds of Euclidean space. But the only problem would have been then how to carry out constructions of things like quotient spaces, which played a huge role in, in our work because we figured out that we could often con construct quotients of manifolds by Lie group actions, which would have been impossible if we had had a concrete definition of manifolds is somehow sitting inside Euclidean space. So on, on the one hand, we've been able to show that the ab very abstract notion of manifold isn't really ab that abstract after all. It really corresponds to immersive manifolds of Euclidean space. On the other hand, by using the abstraction, we're able to construct uh, lots of new manifolds out of old ones by, uh, by a very abstract process, uh, processes of, for example, uh, constructing quotient spaces or constructing covering spaces.